the best way to convince people is to not be too invested in whether they listen. This will be the first of what I hope will become a series of analyses of self-proclaimed philosopher Stefan Molyneux. Uh, we begin here in this clip with him not exploring what the truth is in any deep sense and what it signifies, but by what the best way to convince someone is. This is telling in that he is much more preoccupied with rhetoric than truth. And this becomes much more apparent later on in the video. Because most people respond hierarchically. In other words, they try and figure out whether you're more important than they are, whether you have more power than they are, in which case they'll pretend to listen while plotting to <laughs> stab you in the back. Or they try and figure out if you're less important than they are, in which case they don't bother to listen to you at all. Now, if you're in a situation where you need something from someone, then you will automatically in a lower status because you need something from them and they don't need something from you. Molyneux here takes a quasi-Darwinian survival of the fittest idea and misapplies it to why someone would choose to listen to you or not, explaining that if you need someone to listen to you, they will probably not or reject what you say because people respond hierarchically to need, exercising power over you by ignoring what you say. Therefore, the less one needs people to listen to them, the more they will listen. This makes very little sense upon examination. To take an example, if I make the statement, it is raining outside, and direct it to my friend, the fact that it was said with the intention that he should hear it and realize its implication contains the implicit need for me to be listened to. In other words, I need him to listen when I make a statement. This holds for any statement directed to any individual or group. On a side note, it's quite ironic that Molyneux frames need as hierarchical because he is constantly voicing his need for donations to his audience, putting him on a lower status automatically. Now, if you need someone to believe you, then you are giving them power over you because they have the power to reject what you're saying and thus cause you upset. Now, most people in this world respond to your need with mild sadism. Oh, he needs something from me. I have power. And the only way to exercise that power is to say no. The more you need someone to believe you, the less likely they are to listen. And so when I tell someone something, I'm happy if they listen. I'm passionate that they listen, but I don't need them to listen because the moment I need them to listen, they then focus on my need and whether they should say yes or no. And they feel this inflated sense of petty power. And they're more likely to say no, just to exercise that petty power and less likely to listen to what it is that I have to say. Now, I don't want to come to them also as a dominant, you better listen and I'm gonna tell you, I don't do that at all. I constantly undermine any authority that I have because I don't want people to listen to me because of authority, to think for themselves, that's the point. What Molyneux means here by authority is of course extremely unclear. Conceivably, he could have authority in matters of history as he did get his degree in that field. If he means philosophy, he has no authority in a technical sense, or any other sense for that matter, as anyone that has read his most recent book, The Art of the Argument, can attest his knowledge in the field is extremely sparse. Here he seems to use the word in order to give himself a degree of legitimacy, which he simply does not possess. So I come at it from a neutral standpoint. I'm passionate about what I'm saying. 
I'm happy if they listen. I don't need them to listen. Hmm. The salesman who's desperate is the salesman least likely to succeed. The salesman who's willing to walk away is the one most likely to succeed. The salesman who needs to show who needs to sale the least is the most likely to make the sale. Or the salesman who can pretend <laughs> that he needs to sale the least. So if you want people to listen to you, hand them something, but do not be over invested in them listening to you or they'll say no just to exercise power over you and to not give you what you want, which is how most people operate. Here, Molyneux's idea of truth seems to be analogous to a commodity that can only be sold using salesman's tricks, and not because truth should stand on its own when spoken by someone with enough integrity to not care whether it is believed or not. Right. Well, the thing is, in my experience, people don't change unless, unless they, they hit basically rock bottom. Or even if uh, you might convince them of something uh, logically, they don't act on it. On the well, sure. I mean, m for most people, reason and evidence is just some wild hypothesis. And they have to wait for their experience to hit them over and over again. But the reason and evidence you put there to plant the seeds and to say, this is what's going to happen and here's why. And they're like, well, that's just a wild hypothesis. And then it does happen that way and you gain credibility. Not because they believe in reason and evidence, that's a lot to ask, but just because you were right about something. Molyneux uses the terms reason and evidence, but doesn't define what he means by them in this context, only saying that most people think of them as a wild hypothesis. A hyperbolic statement, to be sure, but one we're to take as true. But let us apply the terms as they are generally understood, with reason standing for the unbiased mental ability to consider something and arrive at a conclusion, and evidence meaning something known of or discovered later that would lead one to a certain conclusion. We are left wondering how anyone can make even the most mundane decision like going to the market because there's no food left in the refrigerator, for example. So they might listen to you more next time. So yeah, bring people reason and evidence. But if you need them, if you're really ego invested and they have to listen to you, they'll just shut you down for the fun of it just because they get to exercise power. And people, have, people feel so powerless in their life for the most part that the moment they get a tiny shred of power, they'll exercise it. And if their power is saying no to your desperate need, they'll do it. It's not even that moral a thing. It's just a basic mammalian response to need. Hmm. But I guess we're all kind of invested in the Western civilization as it is. No, oh, yeah, no, I get it. I get it. I mean, but you still can't show your naked need for people to believe you. Mm. And, and because we, we have respect for the goal of, of achievement. What's the point of having the truth if you can't get anyone to listen? That's being tortured. That's a curse. You, you would not want the truth if you can't affect any positive change with it. So having a truth which you can't bring to the world in an effective manner is worse than having no truth at all. And... The respect for truth is the respect in its transmission. The truth is made valuable in the transmission. There's no point having a cure for a disease in your head if you can't get anyone to take it. Then it's worse than not having the cure at all because you're tortured watching people die needlessly. If you don't have the cure, oh, it's sad they died. If you have the cure and they won't take it, it's sad they died and horrifying that you could have saved them. So the value of truth is not the holding, it is the sharing. It is the transmission of the truth that matters. The possession of it is a curse. You'll notice that Molyneux keeps the term truth vague, and what kind of truth he's referring to is unknown. Because of this, the term takes on an almost mystical or absolute importance, as the holder of truth is necessarily tortured by it, unless he or she tells others about it. 
In this context, Molyneux sounds no different from a preacher urging his flock to share the truth of the, of the gospel far and wide. This is also where one can see that the accusations of Molyneux being cult-like come from, and whatever pretense to philosophy falls away. The transmission of it is salvation, and therefore we must bend our wills to whatever makes the truth spread the widest and the fastest. That is the organizing principle of being in possession of the truth. Not that you have it, but that you share it. All right. So whatever we do, whatever is necessary to share the truth, that we do. So that we turn the truth into a blessing rather than a curse. And that's my organizing principle. What is the most effective way to get the truth out there? So people attack me. Oh, he's a terrible guy. Good. It's good that they've attacked me because now more people hear about the truth, right? And there are people who will hate me no matter what because they think it's about me rather than the truth. I'm just some guy, right? How could it be about me? I know the camera is only focused on me against this stark white background where I talk for hours, but you're an idiot for inferring that this show is all about me. It's like getting mad at the envelope rather than the letter. It makes no sense, right? There are people who hate me, they're going to hate me no matter what. And there are people who love me no matter what. But the people in the middle, they may hear terrible things about me, say, oh, that's terrible. I find out more. Oh, it's a pretty good argument. Oh, I want some evidence for that. Oh, he's got a source for that. He's got an expert on about that. Presumably the people in the rational middle just haven't heard Molyneux's truth yet and only need to hear his so-called arguments and listen to the experts he brings on the show in order to be convinced. The other two extremes would be irrational by default, as they would either love or hate him no matter what. This seems a fine rhetorical defense against his critics, but doesn't say much for his fans. So then the people who want to get people to hate me end up being hated themselves for lying about me. This is natural, right? This is the way that the truth spreads. It is not... It is not a pleasant thing to watch the spread of truth. The truth crosses the landscape half an angel and half a zombie. Molyneux goes on for quite a bit here, spouting very bad analogies for truth that I edited out, as they do nothing to illumine what he means by the term. It was difficult to get through, and I wouldn't wish to inflict his analogies on anyone. Truth sucks! <laughs> There's only one thing that sucks more than the truth, and that's long-term lies. Short-term lies are beautiful. Long-term lies are hell itself. The truth is a predator that hunts what lies within us. And what lies within us runs and fights and claws to remain with the herd of liars, to remain with the wildebeest of wanderlust, of falseness. That's what loves lies within us, the Satan of our syrupy false selves. The truth comes along with facts and reason and evidence and arguments and data and says, you think you are alive, but you are but a ghost cast by historical prejudice. You think you have form and you have shape. You think because you move, you live. You are a skeleton blown by the winds of all the bullshit that came before. That is who you are. Who you are is who you ain't. Who you are is somebody who was evacuated and filled in with the prejudice and lies and servitude of the masters of mankind. Molyneux, a supposed atheist, sets up a pseudo-Christian description of the sinful nature that we all possess. His truth, of course, being the only antidote to our false selves. You are a useful robot and a useful idiot designed in the vast horizontal slave market of whacking down anybody who sticks their head up from the trench of delusion. I think I see something. Cut him down. Hey, is that the phone ringing? Is that the truth? Smash the phone. Don't find it. And we all think that we want the truth. And then someone comes along and speaks the truth. Fuck you. Here's some hemlock. <laughs> Fuck you. You're a cult leader. <laughs> Fuck you. You're racist. Oh, this is the truth. Hey, we all want the truth, though. We truth is cool. Oh, not that truth. 
Oh, no, no, no. No, that truth? No, no, that's bad. That's bad truth. Good truth. Good, good truth is over there. Good truth is with the comfortable delude. This bad truth. Bad truth causes problems truth. That's where we are as a society, but thank God we can finally see it. Well, thank the internet and thank the truth tellers that we can finally see it. Finally, we see the shadow cast by humanity when the truth is visible at the click of a button. Truth is visible at the swipe of a fingertip. You can finger the truth <laughs> and impregnate your mind thereby <laughs> to mix my analogies. So you focus on the truth. You focus on that which transmits the truth and you take your punishment for telling the truth because that's what the truth demands. And if you can live without doing it, I guess you can try. I can't though. I can't. I was just thinking about this today, like the race and IQ stuff. Hey, whew. If I could have stood in front of this camera and said I cared about the world and wanted to make it better without talking about that, it would have been really tempting. I just can't. So to close out our short analyses, the other shoe finally drops. Molyneux takes truth out of limbo and puts it in the concrete context of the controversial issue of race and IQ. This is a world-changing and world-saving truth, as he goes on to explain and has talked about in numerous videos in the past. How dividing different groups by IQ will do this is not explained. We are just to assume that it will. The implication is that somehow he was the only one privy to this great truth. Though Molyneux has no part in developing the concept of IQ, nor race. He does like the idea of the division of intelligence, however. Perhaps because in this division his skin color puts him near the top. Unfortunately, his so-called arguments do not. Thank you for listening.